A very hearty good afternoon to each one of you present over here. Welcome to Federal Bank, your perfect banking partner presents Tycoon Kerala 2014. It is indeed a very wonderful afternoon and everyone is looking absolutely handsome and gorgeous together. But I am not getting the level of energy that I am expecting from you vibrant, energetic people out there. So can I get a more energetic good afternoon from you all? Good afternoon. Yes, thank you so much. As we all know that the Thai Kerala activities are directed towards fostering entrepreneurship and nurturing entrepreneurs. And today, we have sessions on e-commerce and retail. Ladies and gentlemen, with huge round of applause, let's welcome our wonderful dignitaries to the dais. Mr. Deepak Aswani, the Managing Director of the Raymond Shop. Professor Naveen C. Amble, IIMK. And Mr. James Joseph, CEO Jackfruits 365. A huge round of applause to the wonderful dignitaries. May I introduce to you moderator of our session, Mr. Deepak Aswani. He has got a lot of firms including Lachmandas and Sons, Aswani Enterprises, Prestige Textile Enterprises, Prestige Textile Distributors. His awards and recognitions include Best Showroom Bombay Dying, Best Showroom Raymond, Best Showroom Park Avenue, Gold Dealer ITC, Best Service Partner Amway, Award from Cochin University of Service and Technology, and Distinguished Speaker at various management fora. He was the former chairman of Kerala Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ernaklim, and presently he is the chairman of Cigarette and Tobacco Dealers Association, Kerala, and he was the former president of Shop and Office Holders Association, JCDA Commercial Complex, Ernaklim. Ladies and gentlemen, with huge round of applause, let's welcome Mr. Deepak Aswani. Over to you, sir. A uh, very good afternoon to one and all present here, particularly the dignitaries on the dais. Uh, well, for today's format, uh, we are talking about uh, retail and uh, e-commerce. So, what I would be doing is I would be taking a little bit of the uh, retail evolution and growth. What is happening on the retail front? Uh, there's already a huge scare every day when you open up the papers you find huge full page ads of uh, the e-commerce sites coming up and uh, offering you all that you wanted at prices that you never dreamt of so suddenly there's a fear in the retail the traditional retail that are we going to get swept off our feet like what happened to the mobile revolution one fine day you were dialing on phones and you straight away moved up uh, to mobile phones some children have not even seen those type of phones, you know, the phones with which you dial. So, is that going to happen or is it going to be a steady thing? Or is there a st uh, still large segment of the population that does not want to get into e-tailing? And uh, Mr. Naveen and uh, <coughs> Mr. James Joseph. Mr. James Joseph himself is an entrepreneur. Uh, Mr. Naveen would be talking in terms of the theoretical aspects of uh, e-commerce and give us the various models in e-commerce. We are talking about the marketplace, the taxation and other things which are involved. So talking of retail, can we do one thing? Uh, just to give you a little exercise after lunch, can we all move from the back to the front so that we look a cozy crowd at least? Thank you, I think that row from the back please. Backbenchers are famous for some other things. Well, retail itself is an industry, you know, whatever you manufacture, one has to consume. So in that respect, retail is probably the one which value adds to whatever is manufactured and finally gives it to the consumer. So we break it into pieces or into sizes that are welcome to the consumer fit for his consumption. So whatever is produced is ultimately fodder for retail. So in effect, retail is probably the largest single industry. In terms of uh, real money value, in 2017, it is expected to cross 1000 billion US dollars. That is the total retail. Organized retail, the so-called modern retail, which has been taking place ever since 1995, has only touched probably uh, one sixteenth of the whole thing. So there is going to be a large shift towards uh, what you see in terms of malls, in terms of uh, supermarkets, 
in terms of speciality stores and of course e-commerce uh, uh, e also so <coughs> retail is only one part of e-commerce e-commerce itself is a major subject because it deals not only with retail it also deals with uh, any commerce that's done on electronic form uh, be it with the government or with the citizen or with the consumer so that I think Naveen would stress on that uh, prior to 1995 we had only a small segment of domestic players in uh, organized uh, brand outlets. We could count them on fingers. For Raymond's itself in 1986, we had just competition only from three or four players like Zodiac. There was a brand called Liberty, if you can remember, and a brand called Wings. Today we have more than 500 players and we also have the significant uh, change in the sense that there are regional players. So you would find a brand which is doing extremely well, a brand like let's say Otto, which is a brand of Pothis, for which our cinema star Dulkar Salman is the brand ambassador. That brand is doing very well in the south. Likewise, you would find a brand like Crimson in the Bangalore region. And as you go towards the north, regionally there are different brands. There's a chain of stores like uh, Jade Blue, who are actually dressing the Prime Minister today. Whatever he wears, the very fact that every day he is wearing a new bandi or a new bangala or a jacket, it's all coming in from Jade Blue. So there are people who are getting into that level of uh, uh, finesse. And uh, it is only after 1995 that new players in the apparel sector, because we got ourselves freed from the cottage sector and moved over to the large scale manufacture. Till such time the license raj prevailed and the cottage sector restricted the number of pieces that could be manufactured. The 2005-8 uh, period was the major expansion with entry of international players with and business houses committed to organize retail in various sectors like food, white goods, general merchandise and in addition to apparel. In fact Amazon made its way through, through Bharti retail and they were almost setting up stores till this clamp on the FDI restrictions came in. Now more on FDI restrictions we can delve on uh, if there is a question answer, answer session on this. And uh, retail beyond top 20 cities is what is the current trend right now. The top 20 cities, the metros are all overflowing and there is a scarcity of land. The rent factor is almost 15% of the cost of the product today. So obviously people are now moving over to tier 2, tier 3 cities and uh, <coughs> this uh, online retailing has also enabled pan India presence and reach. So now it's easier to launch a brand in a city like let's say Raipur, Sholapur or any other uh, uh, city. If you really go through the statistics you find cities like Raipur, Rajkot and all uh, they are doing much better business than what even some of the metros are doing today. There's an increasing exposure of international brands thanks to television and uh, the cinema. The demographic dividend is fueling consumption. By 2020, the average age of the Indian population is expected to be 29 and 70% of this population is going to be under the working age group. So there's going to be a lot of money also to be spent. There are going to be increasing aspirations of Indian consumers a lot of urbanization taking place because there is dual incomes coming in. Probably the whole family also is working. Nuclear families, working women, there's access to technology and there's a free flow of ideas. The emerging trends, there are alternate retail channels, brick and mortar, direct selling, home shopping and e-tailing. But the consumer, we have the heterogeneous consumer. There's a lot of segmentation to be done because what is good for uh, Paul may not be good for uh, Harry. So making segmentation and targeting difficult. The same lady wears westerns, she wears saris, she wears formals, she wears suits. So it's not that age old only sari is allowed. Now they wear everything and the best part of it is they go and mix and match also. So most of the leading stores, stores like Shoppers Stop etc. They have their own shop brands. Shoppers uh, Stop brand is called Stop. So you are at freedom now to pick your own kurti, the bottom, the shawl and then you can go on keeping mixing and matching and finally you also can end up in a Zara the lifestyle preferences beliefs and value systems exposure to global trends 
we have the example of fmcg giants who need to maintain a portfolio of brands for each category to serve each segment needs the example i can give you of two biscuits that is britannia and uh, we have sunfeast today they have been you know diversifying into segments which were never uh, heard of uh, like uh, we in itc we have sunfeast we have this dark fantasy under dark fantasy we have three or four variants to suit different uh, customers then we have the cookies the cookies again into various segments you have the digestive cookies and you also have the regular cookies the one which are really uh, rich and which are supposed to have been baked on the spot and they've all got individual packing also to give it a premiumness <coughs> there's a lot of value buying taking place which is typical of the indian consumer everyone looks for a bargain so more information options competition leads consumers to seeking maximum value at lowest cost you have the rise of the stores like max you have fashion at big bazaar reliance retail these are stores which are coming up in a big way and value retail is uh, picking up day by day then there is this concept of the end of season sale which takes place it started with once a year now it's twice a year and now the foreign brands have come out with a new concept called mid season sale so virtually you have most of these big stores having discounts almost throughout the year customers wait for these sales to happen attack and then buy only once or twice the average indian consumer basically spends only 6 days in a year for shopping whereas in the rest of the world almost 40% of leisure time is spent in window shopping and shopping digital penetration this because of the cost access availability of internet influencing pre purchase purchase and post purchase via comparisons online buying and feedback trails are taking place a lot of youth centric brands have come in you have the case of watches fast track you have cycles firefox bicycles so the older brands are uh, meant for the older guys the new guys have new brands for them even for deodorants you have a brand called wildcraft which is basically meant for the uh, youth then you also have uh, a segment which is called the semi urban india now you have the urban india in the metros you have the rural in the past if something didn't sell in the urban sector it would be pushed shunted to the rural side now you have a sector like i told you these cities like uh, uh, rajkot shola this thing raipur etc where even the cricket stadiums are overflowing today whenever there's a one day match and uh, for these places they get incomes from their agricultural side also as well as they come and work in these uh, segments so there's a new segment called the semi urban india which is also have got lot of money and their tastes are different from those of that in the city or the rural area like the product the mantras of store design are also changing so today nobody wants to go to a rickety rackety shop they want to go to a nice well decorated uh, visually pleasing uh, showroom clean and uh, air conditioned which also takes up the cost of the product in any case emerging consumer behavior there's a uh, demand for ready made and ready to use both in the uh, wearing uh, aspect as well as the eating aspect there's a lot of impulse buying and instant gratification is sought for there's a desire to own brands or upgrade to better brands that's a constant process and every marketing man's dream is to upgrade the person to the highest level there's a shifting focus from products to services we just saw one service uh, which dr nene talked about how uh, dancing was made into an exercise so you have personal wellness grooming eating out hobbies these are all the service uh, aspects and there's a lot of self indulgence so the person wants to spend money for himself there's an inclination towards specialty retailers offering experiential shopping so people go to mother care crossword for books sunglass hut for glasses and so on and there are desire for solutions over products they're, they're looking for the complete package with expert advice so you now have the concept of a salesman working with a tablet and he has all the technical details of a product uh, with him as he walks along the side to you and explains to you what is the product and what are the technical aspects of that product in fact a very interesting uh, aspect in uh, raymond's the training is done on the standards of singapore airlines so it comes in a package that uh, the salesman is told on which side of the customer he should be standing and he should be bent 15 degrees 
almost like a semi bow so that he uh, speaks of respect and uh, he cannot point out at things he has to show the way like this and uh, he has to speak in such a manner and there will be always one person in the aircraft when you fly who knows the language of every single passenger in the sense that if the crew is of something like 16 people and there is a crowd of about 200 people in the aircraft these 16 guys will know the language spoken by all these 200 people that's the uh, customer service, service that is being asked for and uh, given by many of the companies today and all this is smitten by technology uh, we come back to brand strategy for most of the retailers basically it's for enabling lives brand need to enrich lives and provide solutions misguiding or fooling the customer through smart communication is now impossible you have the idea campaign which says ullu banayenge that will not work now inclusive versus exclusive how targeted should a brand be does exclusivity work in a society of converging incomes and aspirations so it's going to be very difficult to be exclusive because everybody has got his hands on to everything the green strategy adopt the green strategy now while it's feasible everywhere we talk about the green strategy now hotels are becoming green offices are becoming green and so on society like tobacco liquor ghee carbonated drinks ready to eat fast foods then you need to have a counter strategy promoting responsible drinking running a de addiction center mass media awareness campaigns etc i think kerala would do well to go into these aspects the ears of the customer in the name of 360 degree campaign striking the right balance and not overdoing it and finally there's a crm program you should always have a crm program in your marketing strategy a good customer loyalty program will always bring back your customer and the customer who comes back to you always is responsible for all your growth in your business so these are the trends in retail I'll now pass on the uh, mic to uh, my friend uh, Mr. Naveen Amli, who is Assistant Professor IIMK and he'll lead you through the e-commerce uh, session. And after that, uh, Mr. James Joseph will talk to us about the practical experiences that he faces while putting up a site and the various payment issues and other things. We'll also have a question and answer session after this. In case you have questions, I would be grateful if you can quickly write it down on a chit and pass it on to us. That, would, that way we could go a little faster. So over to Dr. Naveen. Thank you. Great. Uh, is it better? Okay, good. Uh, so I wasn't sort of sure exactly uh, what to talk about today because e-commerce is such a large uh, you know, uh, domain. Okay? So there's three things that I think uh, you need to know. One is, uh, which Deepak was discussing, uh, how big is e-commerce going to get and sort of which industries will e-commerce really succeed and where is it going to be sort of a small player, right? For example, e-commerce is never going to be big in uh, the automobile industry, but it will be huge in uh, the travel industry. Okay? Uh, so they're kind of related, but the effect is completely different, right? Uh, e-commerce has been around for 20 years in the U.S. It's a mature industry, but they have almost no headway in selling cars online. But the travel industry has been completely transformed. Right? They wiped out all the regular uh, agents. And I think Thomas Cook and a couple others are just surviving. Okay? So some industries will be affected more by e-commerce than others. Okay? So that's one uh, topic. Okay? Another one that you probably need to know or you should know is about the uh, impact of brands. Okay? Uh, e-commerce is all about brands. Okay? Uh, if your uh, company does not have a very, 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 very strong brand, you have no chance of surviving. Okay. You'll get wiped out by someone else quickly. Okay. If you're a brick and mortar shop, like a regular shop, you can last. But online, without a strong brand, uh, you're finished. Okay. Uh, so those are two topics, but uh, you know, I'm not going to discuss those today since I have limited time. Uh, I've been thinking about what to uh, talk about, and I realize you're all entrepreneurs. Right? So I I'm sure that mo uh, a large number of you here want to start your own business. So what I thought is I'll discuss online business models with you. Okay. So I'll discuss some of the popular online business models. And maybe one of these will make sense because I'm sure you already have some idea in mind if you're in this session. Okay. Uh, so I'll try and do this in about 20, 25 minutes. And then uh, uh, you know uh, James will speak for a while. And then we can have a discussion after that. 
Okay, so what is a business model? Okay, a business model is just a way that your company makes uh, money. Okay, it's also called the architecture of your revenue. Okay, uh, so what is it that you're going to do, and how is it that you're going to be compensated for what it is that you do? Okay, and that's all the business model is. Okay. And a business model has two components. It's a very simple way of looking at it. There's the activity model which is what activity are you doing, uh, or what service are you providing. Okay? And then the other one is the revenue model. Okay? So how do you uh, ask for money or make money from whatever service it is that you're providing. Okay? So under activity, we have the merchant model, which is your classic flip card and so on. You have the manufacturer direct, brokerage, community, content, and service. And revenue can be made through advertising, commissions, margins, and also what is uh, known as subscription and utility. Okay? And I'll go over each of these with a brief example. And eventually what you do is when you start your business, you take one of each and you put them together. You perform one of these activities and then you use one of these revenue techniques and then you build your business model. Okay? Uh, and most dot-com companies would fall under these. There's a few other categories we could come up with, but these pretty much cover all the major ones. Okay? So let me start with the activity models. Okay? So this is what you do. So the most common one is what's called the merchant model, uh, which is basically being a merchant online. Okay, you're doing what people have done uh, since the dawn of time. Right? Uh, you get something from someone else, and then you add a margin to it, and then you sell it to somebody else. Okay? And companies do the same thing online. Your Flipkart, your Amazon, these are all merchants. Okay? Uh, it's a very uh, simple business model. Right? You do wholesaling and retailing uh, using uh, the World Wide Web. So that's a very simple one. So Home Shop 18, Flipkart, iTunes, uh, FutureBazaar.com, all of these would fall under the merchant model. The other one is the Manufacture Direct model. Okay, and the classic example is Dell. All this means is that the manufacturer directly sells uh, to the end customer. Okay? So they don't use wholesalers, they don't use retailers. They use the power of the internet to sell directly to the end user. And Dell is the one that's really made this famous. Uh, although they've changed a uh, little bit in India because their traditional model didn't work. So Dell has uh, revenues about 57 billion US. And in the US, they were all uh, about direct sales. But in India, they've changed. And even in the US, they've started to change quite a bit. In India now, they have uh, 150 retail stores. They're not very big, uh, where people can go and get a sense of the product. And then they'll place the order for you. Uh, but essentially, they're a manufactured direct uh, company. So these are what their showrooms look like. You can't really buy anything there, per se. Right? You can go in there, get a sense of what it feels like, and then they'll place the order for you online. Okay? The big advantage of this is it completely cuts out all the middle players, which means that your margins go up, or you can sell for less than the competition. Right? So more margin or less margin, but you wipe out the competition. Okay? So this is another uh, widely used model. So obviously, you need to be a major manufacturer. You don't have to be major, but you need to be a manufacturer to use this model. You sell directly uh, through the. Uh, the third one is a very famous one, which is the brokerage model. Okay? So brokerage is just someone who well brokers between uh, two parties. Okay? Uh, so there's a buyer and a seller, and the broker comes in between and brings them together and helps them sort of close the transaction. Okay? And this is a very big model online. And, of course, the most famous one of this is eBay. Okay. So eBay is a classic uh, online broker uh, where they use an auction format to sort of uh, connect uh, buyers and sellers together. Okay. And uh, Alibaba does the same thing for B2B. And uh, to an extent, Amazon and even Flipkart have an, uh, have an element of brokerage to them. Uh, you may have all noticed that... Uh, you know, if you've been using Flipkart for a while, uh, it was just from Flipkart. Then you started to see WS Retail, which is owned by Flipkart. And then after a while, you started to see other companies in there. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, Flipkart acting more as a uh, uh, marketplace, which is uh, a kind of broker. Okay. Where they don't keep the item in stock, uh, but they connect you to the seller. And then they pass on your uh, financial and uh, uh, your address and they uh, send it to you. Okay. So that's a variation, we'll discuss that in a bit. So there's an auction broker like eBay, a transaction broker like PayPal. Uh, there's also uh, 
a, a virtual marketplace like Amazon, where you can buy uh, stuff from others. Uh, it's not being sent to you by Amazon, it's being sent to you by uh, someone else. A variation of the brokerage model is what's called the infomediary model. Okay? An infomediary is a broker, but they don't get involved in the transaction. Okay? Uh, when you buy something on eBay, eBay gets involved in the transaction. Right? They take money from you and hand it over to the other person and they even get involved in the logistics and letting you know when something is in the mail and so on. An infomediary does not get involved in any of that, uh, uh, in any of those steps. All they do is say, look, here's a bunch of sellers, here's a bunch of buyers, you guys figure it out. Okay? And a classic example, anyone? Uh, OLX or Quicker or Craigslist. Right? Uh, they are infomediaries. Right? Uh, they don't get involved in a transaction. Look, here's a, a Honda Accord uh, 1999, uh, two lakhs, right? Uh, there's his phone number, email, uh, you know, call him or her, uh, go see the car, if you like it, exchange money. We have nothing to do with it, right? All we do is we list that information and we let you connect, okay? So they are brokers, but they don't go all the way like a traditional broker, okay? They don't get involved in the actual transaction. So that is an infomediary. So that's also a possibility. Uh, Magic Bricks is another one, 99 acres as well, if anyone's used that. Right? So you can go, you can see an apartment for sale or an apartment for rent, uh, but they don't get involved in that. Right? It's just, this is a phone number, 99 something, and you call them, and they sort of, you know, you discuss with them. Okay? So that's the infomediary one. Okay? And another slight variation is what's called the uh, affiliate model. Okay? Um, anyone have any idea of what an affiliate is? An affiliate is just sort of someone who sends business your way, okay? An affiliate or an associate. Okay? Uh, you may have noticed online that uh, you may have gone to a, a, a book review website and there's a link that says uh, buy this from Flipkart or buy this from Amazon. Uh, the reason they do that is because if you click on that, well, you'll get redirected to Amazon. And if you end up buying that product, Amazon will give them anywhere from 3% to 15% as commission. And eBay does the same thing. And for a while, you may have noticed this, uh, this is a while ago, seven, eight years ago. If you put a link to download uh, Firefox or Chrome on your uh, website, and someone clicked on that and downloaded Firefox, they would pay you one US dollar. So if you send 1,000 people to download uh, Chrome, you would get 1,000 US. Okay. It was either Chrome or Firefox. So these are all affiliates, and this is a nice way of making money, but this is more at the hobby level. Okay? Very few people actually make this into a viable business. But that is possible, by sending business to someone else. Uh, Amazon has a very well-known uh, associate program, and I don't think you can see this, uh, it doesn't really matter, but these are the commission rates. Okay? So if you sell electronic products, they'll give you a 4% commission, uh, but if you sell, uh, so depending on what you sell for Amazon as an associate or as an affiliate, uh, you get a commission for it. Okay? Uh, a large number of people make money on this, but this isn't really sort of a lo long-term or a large-scale system. Although there are a few websites like fatwallet.com and others you know, who make a few hundred thousand a month uh, US uh, just by being affiliates. Okay? It's possible, but I wouldn't sort of, this can be a hobby. Okay? If you blog and you're blogging about a book or a vacation, you can put a link on there, and then you know if someone does go and book something through, by clicking through your website, uh, you know you get a little commission. Okay, but it's not something you would sort of give up your job for. Okay, uh, maybe the others, but not this one. There's another one called the community model, okay, which is your classic Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Red Hat, Linux, and others. Okay? Uh, so what this is is sort of a large number of people getting together, and then you make money out of that. So, you know, the best example today is Facebook, right? There's a billion users, uh, they all log in, they do uh, something on there, and then you make money by showing ads. And when they click on the ads, you know, you charge someone else. Uh, so this is another way of making a, a large amount of money. Okay? Uh, 10, 15 years ago, this was sort of, people knew it was gonna be big, but they never thought anyone would make much money out of it. But Facebook's come along, and I think last year they made about 10 billion in revenue. Uh, you may have all have noticed that Facebook's stock sort of tanked after the IPO. The big question was, how are these guys going to make money? Okay. And uh, one of the worries was a lot of people started to access Facebook through their uh, phones. Okay. And uh, you know, the analysts said, look, no one is going to click on ads on the phone. 
because you know you all see in the old ads right there'll be a little ad at the bottom and you know no one clicked on that okay? so what facebook did is they completely changed the format of the ads you may have noticed this uh, if you use facebook you've seen the sponsored stories uh, those are all paid for okay? and they integrate really really well into the sort of facebook experience so a lot of people tend to click on those and especially on the phone, uh, when you're scrolling through your feed, the sponsored story takes up the entire screen. Okay? So you're much more likely to click on it. Okay? Uh, so they're making a ton of money now. Okay? And it's been about $10 billion, uh, last year. Okay? So the community is also a good way of making uh, money. Okay? Uh, LinkedIn is a good uh, example. Uh, 120 million uh, registered users. And uh, uh, in 2010, in 2014, it's jumped to 300 million. And uh, their IPO, uh, after their IPO, their market cap is 20 billion. Okay. So LinkedIn, which makes, which is basically a community-based website, is worth uh, 20 billion. Uh, that's fine, actually. Two more models. Okay. Uh, another big one is the content model. Okay. And this is basically your YouTube and others. Right? Where you provide some content, whether it's Times of India, or a newspaper, or a blog, or uh, movies, or songs. And people access those, uh, uh, those contents, and then uh, they, you make money out of that. Okay? So any magazine, any blog, any newspaper, any uh, uh, music uh, website, or anything like that, a gossip website, any of those uh, would fall under the content model. Okay? And finally, you have what's called the service model. The service model is basically providing some kind of service business uh, solution as a service, okay. uh, what's also known as uh, SaaS. Right? Uh, so what this is, you provide some kind of a service, whether it's email or design or some kind of productivity uh, software. For example, Constant Contact or Pidoku. Has anyone used uh, Constant Contact? Okay, it's, it's, a, mailing, uh, it's a mailing list management uh, software. Okay. Uh, you can manage your contacts and you can send them uh, newsletters and so on in a way that doesn't sort of get blocked by the uh, spam filters. Okay. So that's a well-known company. Right? So that's one service they provide. Pidoko is a web design, uh, what's known as wireframing. You have a website in mind and you want to design it. Uh, you just want to flesh it out like you do on a piece of paper. You can use Pidoko. Okay. And they charge a monthly fee for that. There's Google Docs. Gmail is also a service. And Salesforce.com also lets you manage your sales contacts. I can also include infrastructure, for example, Rackspace or GoDaddy or the uh, Amazon Cloud. Uh, does anyone use the Amazon Cloud or Rackspace? Yeah. So that this is, again, uh, the service model. Okay, they're providing you a service, and we'll look at their revenue model in a bit, how they make money out of that. Okay. So these are the things that you can do uh, to provide value to customers. Okay. Uh, you can be a merchant. You can be a broker. It can be an intermediary. You can be an affiliate. Uh, you can uh, set up a community, you can provide content, or you can provide a service, for example. Uh, these are the things that you can do. So the next question is, how do you make money by providing one of these types of activities to customers? Okay. So we'll look at the revenue models uh, very briefly. Okay. The most common revenue model is the advertising model. And the reason it's very popular is because you don't need to get involved with any kind of financial processing. Okay. Uh, Google's AdSense has done a really good job. Where you just sign up with them, you put a little script on your website, and it generates ads. And if they click on it, Google will deposit the money directly into your uh, savings or checking account. Okay. And that's a multi-billion, uh, many billions, in fact, uh, dollar business. Okay. Which is why most people like the advertising model. There's no minimum requirement. If your blog only gets a few hundred visitors, you can still put ads on there and make some money out of it. Okay. It's a low cost, uh, no sort of setup uh, uh, aspects involved with it. Okay. So this is very, very common. Okay. Uh, so what model does this work best with? It works best with the intermediary model, for example, Quaker and OLX. Right. So if you're wondering how Quaker makes money, I mean, initially, of course, they're making money, or they're not making money, they get, they're spending money from the VC, right? I mean, the VC is giving them money and they're burning the, uh, through that. But eventually, if they do make money, it will be through 
ads. Okay, they may have other services, for example, sponsored listing. So they'll take your listing and make it prominent, but largely they make money through ads. Okay? And the same thing with the community model. Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, they may make a little bit from membership and so on, but 99% of their money comes from advertising by putting ads for other companies like Jabal. And it's a little hard to see, but if you can see the little green bar uh, somewhere in the middle of the screen, the horizontal green bar, that actually says buy from Amazon or buy from someone else. Right? So if you read the book review, like it, uh, you click on buy from Amazon. And when the link gets redirected, there's a little code in the URL that has your ID, right? yours as in Goodreads ID. Okay? So if the person ends up buying something, uh, then that ID is given a credit of whatever the commission rate is. 2%, 5%, 10% gets sent over to them. Okay? And if you click on the Jabong ad, uh, then it doesn't matter if they buy something from Jabong or not. It's, just, it's per click. Right? But the Amazon is per purchase. So it doesn't matter if you send 1,000 people. If nobody bought anything, you don't make any money out of it. But if 1,000 people clicked on the Jabong uh, website and they're paying you uh, 5 rupees a click, then you make 5,000 bucks. Okay? So that's sort of the difference between the affiliate and the advertising model. So this is one way of making money. There's the margin and commission uh, uh, models, which is what your Amazon and your Flipkart do, okay, and your eBay. Okay. So eBay is commission-based. So if you exchange something for, say, 5,000 rupees, they have a commission of 2.2% you know, or something like that, which is what they take, and that's how they make money. Okay. Technically speaking, Flipkart and Amazon should be purely on margin where they get something with a wholesaler for 1,000 rupees, they mark it up to uh, 1,200, and then they make 200 rupees profit. It's obviously a little more complicated than that. Okay? Uh, they do send back stock. They have minimum advertised pricing. Uh, the wholesaler has a lot of input into how their products are sold and so on. So they're almost sort of a mix between margin and commission uh, because the model isn't as clear as you sell me 1,000 pallets for 1,000 rupees each and I'll mark it up and sell it. Okay. That's generally how it works, but it's a little more complicated than that. So I put them both under margin and commission. Okay. So Flipkart is a good example of this. Okay. Uh, I've soured on Flipkart after their uh, big billion sale. So I was a little annoyed by that. And uh, So it turns out big billion was for them to make a billion rupees as soon as possible. Right. So. Uh, uh, the deals were, I think some of you saw the analysis, right? The price jumped up over two days by 100%, and they gave you 50% off, right? So many people are upset. I mean, in their defense, they say, look, we just removed all the, it was already on sale. We removed the sale and then put a new sale on there. But I haven't bought anything since then. Until that point, I'd spent a little over one lakh on Flipkart, and I really haven't bought anything since then. This is the other issue I, I spoke to you about earlier, which is your brand. Okay. Uh, your brand is something you need to sort of jealously guard. Uh, because something goes wrong, it can affect you uh, quite badly. Okay. So I was a hardcore Flipkart person. Now I'm more into Amazon and Snapchat. Okay. Before they were my distant second and third choice. Okay. Now uh, Flipkart is my third choice, and these are my first and second choice. So, so you've got to be very, very, very careful with your brand. Right? And uh, I mean, everyone makes mistakes, and of course. but. It's something to keep in mind. So who does it work best with? Obviously, the uh, merchant model and the manufacturer direct model works best with uh, commission. Okay. And the last two, you have the subscription model. And subscription is a monthly, or it's a periodic fee. It can be a monthly fee, it can be a weekly fee, it can be an annual sort of membership fee, uh, and so on, or even a daily fee. So this is also widely used. The best thing about the subscription model is uh, once you get the customer, uh, he has to stop paying you money actively. Okay. Uh, Flipkart, he has to sort of actively pay, or she has to actively pay you money, right? Okay, here is 500 rupees. Subscription is once you sort of got them as a customer, they need to stop paying you because their card is going to be billed every 30 days. They're going to be billed, you know, uh, 99 rupees or what, what have you. So unless they decide to stop, you have a very steady stream of money coming on a regular basis. Okay. So if you can get a subscription model up and running, in the long run, even though the amounts you charge may be small, 
in the long run, it can be very beneficial. Right? Because all the uh, customers you've accumulated, uh, you build on those because they're sort of, let's assume that 80% carry on. Uh, you ha you're sitting on top of that 80%, so the pie gets bigger and bigger. Okay? So that's a huge advantage of subscription. So the most famous of this is Netflix, which isn't uh, yet available in India, uh, which is uh, online DVD rental. Uh, is anyone familiar with this? Uh, yeah. It's basically uh, what you do is you pay a fixed monthly amount, and they keep uh, sending you DVDs by mail. Okay. So they send you a DVD, you watch it, uh, you put it in the envelope, you send it back, and then they send you another one from your queue. Okay. Uh, unlike the traditional model, you don't pay per movie that you watch you pay per month. So you watch 20 in a month, of course there's a delay between it coming to you and going back. If you watch 20 in a month, you get the same charge. If you watch one in a month, it's the same charge. The reason it was successful is because there's no late fee. If you want to keep the same DVD with you for two years, no one is going to bother you. But you would obviously pay you know, two years worth of monthly fees. Uh, but there is no sort of anyone calling you. It turned out that the thing that people hated the most about renting movies was the late charge. Okay. So this company came about and they wiped out Blockbuster. Okay. So Blockbuster is bankrupt okay, because of Netflix. And they're very, very successful with the subscription model. Very small amount, right? Like $7.99 a month. It's not really a big deal. But every month, uh, $8 times 12 is almost 100 right? So suddenly that's a lot of money. They're paying you $100 a year uh, for your service. So this is also a very, very successful model. Okay. Big Flix is the Indian equivalent, but it never sort of took off. Okay. Uh, it, uh, it's streaming only, and they only have Indian movies and so on. Uh, it's not a big hit, but they're sort of the Netflix clone in India, if you will. Okay. Again, subscription uh, model. Okay. So it works best with content. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, the New York Times or Netflix and others. Or even a service model like Rackspace where you rent a server for uh, you know, $79 a month and so on. Or uh, salesforce.com, where you can manage your contacts online and they charge you a membership fee of $29.95 for light, $49.95 for the uh, silver package, and $50 for the gold package and so on. Right? These are good ways of making money. Okay. And I'm going to end with the last one, which is the utility model. Utility is another uh, name for the pay-as-you-go model. So most of us uh, have the uh, prepaid phones, right? 97% uh, of all phones in India are prepaid. There's uh, very few postpaid. So that is a pay-as-you-go model. When you go to Airtel.in, and then you load a certain amount of money, and you keep using that, and when you make enough phone calls, it runs out. That's the pay-as-you-go model. Uh, that is also a very successful model. Okay? It's also what's called as metered subscription. Uh, so it works best, with the, again, with the service model and the content model. For example, iTunes. Right? iTunes charges you per song uh, or per uh, movie that you download. Right? Generally, a song is 99 cents, and they charge you per song. So that's the utility model. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry I rushed through it. There's not much time. But those are the possible activity and revenue models that you can mix and match. Okay. So the question becomes, what is your business model? What activity are you going to perform? Are you going to be a merchant, a broker? Are you going to provide content or some kind of service? And how are you going to make money out of that? Are you going to set up a credit card system? Are you going to outsource that to, say, uh, Google Pay? Or is it going to be advertising-based? Okay, so these are the questions you need to ask. Okay? So you need to put these two together, your activity and your revenue. You put them together, you have your business model. Okay? So whatever ideas you have in mind, uh, you know, Put that in the right category and then figure out how you're going to make money out of it. And that's the first step towards starting your business. So I hope that's uh, been helpful to you. And uh, I'll uh, hand it back to uh, the Big time. Our next speaker of the day is Mr. James Joseph. James Joseph is the founder of Professional Bharati, a social networking platform for Indian professionals. Through Professional, he is helping Indian professionals to find their way back to their hometowns and villages while continuing with their career. 
Mr. James Joseph has over 18 years of sales and marketing experience in North America, Europe and India with globally reputed organizations like Microsoft, 3M and Ford. In his last role as the Director, Executive Engagement at Microsoft India, he was responsible for strengthening Microsoft relationship with the senior executives of top 200 enterprises in India. Ladies and gentlemen, now may I invite Mr. James Joseph for the session. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm here as the Jackfruit 365 guy. Professional Bharati is what I wrote as a book. Thank you. Okay, so um, when I'm here um, to give you some um, experience from my perspective, you know, how, how I looked at these models in terms of both e-commerce as well as the traditional channels. And then I can share some experiences, you know, this is from my own experience. Before I do that, um, how many of you are what I call grown up businesses in retail? Can you raise your hands? Established businesses in, in Kerala, into retail? I see Mr. Butlers, come on, raise your hands, okay. <laughs> okay, how many of you are uh, startups? Startups, okay. How many of you are planning to start up? Okay, a lot of you, okay. So, when I moved from Microsoft to um, start Jackfruit 365, um, I had to evaluate uh, the different options to reach the product out to the market. Okay, and then, um, and to, to um, right now, I mean, I'm here as an author and as an entrepreneur. Um, and I have both perspectives because the book is available everywhere in every shop through Penguin. So, I mean, you can walk into any shop and you'll find the book. So that's a different model. That's retail, you know, you have it everywhere. There's a distribution channel and it's available everywhere. Whereas Jackfruit this is where you will not find it anywhere. It's only in the cloud. Okay, and you get the jackfruit from the cloud. And why did I choose to do that? Okay, so when I, when I looked at, you know, the traditional retail model as a startup, you are hungry for cash. And you have to, you have to you know, work your way, you have to preserve cash as much as possible, but make it available. And uh, Professor mentioned about the importance of brand. And one way of building a brand is through PR campaign. You have to get a lot of media coverage. And uh, how many of you have read about Jackfruit 365 in a magazine or in a newspaper? Okay, most of you have, have read it somewhere, online or, you know. And to tell you the truth, it has even reached up to Rajasthan Patrika, which is in, in, in Jaipur, in Hindi. And it's all happened, you know, from Farmer's Magazine to Business World, in Canada, in Tamil, um, everywhere you will find an editorial article about Jackfruit 365. How did I manage that within the first, first year itself? With no marketing dollars. I mean, how did I do that? It's because it is available at every nook and corner of India. If a journalist wants to write about um, your product, it has to be available to the reader. Because of the online model, it's available anywhere. I mean, I have customers from Siliguri to Chandigarh to Ahmedabad, Trinalveli. Um, I mean, everywhere because it's possible for me to reach them through online. Okay, so um, second, you know, when you look at the traditional model, um, the traditional distribution retail channel, so modern retail, the first thing is listing fee. You have to pay upfront to the retailer to have your product listed. So that's, that's cash upfront before you sell the first product. Then you have to have the distribution margin. You have to have the stockist, mar so stockist. And then you need to have all the inventory lying outside. Okay, and then, say, then uh, the fourth one, tax. Tax is different different states. So if you're selling in local, local shops, you have to worry about the local tax. You have to worry about, so for example, jackfruit, uh, to, to my surprise, the tax for jackfruit, free state jackfruit in, in Kerala is different than in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu, they consider it as a, as a dried product, not as a processed food. You have to fight the battle if you want to convert that too. So that's 14% versus, 14 versus 5%. That's significant difference. And as a startup, you don't have the muscles you know, in terms of getting all the tax laws, all that sorted out. So how do you limit all that to, to preserve your resources? So I looked at, you know, okay, so A, I don't have the startup cash to give it to every retail shop, pay, pay the listing fee and make it available. Second, I have to have the PR coverage. That is the only way I can get my brand out there. So which means I have to make it available anywhere. And my target audience for the product is the Flipkart generation, the Indian professionals living in a city. They are used to buying it online. They're used to buying it on, on, on Amazon.com. So they, they understand that. Second, you know, I can tie the online business with the social media campaign. I can see, you know, so if I make an offer on online, I can link that with my Facebook page. 
I can link that with my, my Twitter campaign. So I can see who is coming. I can, I can see the analytics. Whereas, um, to give an example, you know, so I have two shops. Um, I give it uh, to retail. And I'll tell you why I did it. Okay, so uh, because I only had the online model. It is purely practical reason. It is practical reason means people, um, there were three s regular Sundays I had to go to the church with the jackfruit packs in the back of my, my car. Because the media coverage took so much interest that everybody wanted me to, to buy jackfruit from me. People will come to my home to buy jackfruit. And that is not scalable, right? You can't, you can't afford that. So I had to have a local shop where I can point people if you want. Because you know, at home, they, I mean, when you go to the church, if you tell them you buy a credit card, they can see you. They will chase you. Okay, so why don't you bring it? So I had to have a way, I mean, it's just, just a workaround. So giving it in one shop in Kochi was a workaround. Second was the NRIs. NRIs, you know, uh, especially with fruit like jackfruit, people get emotional. It's, they love it. They, I mean, when, they, when they want it, they want it. And, and they, they come after you. I send lengthy emails, you know, my, my son is so fond of jackfruit. I need, you know, he needs to have it. And we are only here for a week. And we don't have time to order it online and wait for the courier to arrive. So I gave it at the Kochi airport. So purely for NRIs. NRIs are not here for a long period of time. So if you, if you give it, if you pay online, you have to wait for the del delivery to come in. So that was not practical for the NRIs. So for that, I gave it to the um, uh, airport. That was not for the, for the business model. It was purely from a practical point of view. I get a lot of complaints to, to avoid that I gave it in Churchill. Then a customer who bought it online, went to a Chennai shop and said, okay, like, you know, it's a mom and pop shop and you know, they, they provide gourmet food. Went to them, you must have jackfruit 365 at your shop. You know, this is in Chennai, everyone loves jackfruit. You should have it there. And they called me, I made it available. And I sent it to them. And then, um, because you know, as a startup, you should think of this from a startup with limited resource. Right? You want to track everything yourself. You don't have a huge army of people you know, tracking all the sales at every channel. And this shop, they, they made available. And then I call them every time and to understand what is the stock situation. Please call us back in 10 minutes. And I keep on calling them, keep on chasing them. I won't get the stock level. And I, I dropped it. I said, okay, forget it. I can't, I, can't, I mean, it's not, my management time is not, you know, it doesn't allow me to make that follow-ups. And I, then six months later, I went there uh, to Chennai and I said, okay, so what happened? What happened to the first lot which you got? And then they, they gave me a check. So they had issued a check in my name they used to distributors coming to the shop, looking at the shelf, what is the current stock, they restack it, and they collect the check and go back. They're not used to somebody following up. They're not used to somebody calling them on the phone. It is they provide the shelf space. Somebody walks in there every week, looks at what is the stock level, replaces the shelf, and then collect the check and go. That means you need to have a distribution network. You need to have, so that's how much cash outstanding you have. So from a cash flow point of view, that was not practical for me. So now let's let's talk about the, the, the good you know the good part of, of um, um, using the e-commerce model as a startup. So first I talked about reach, right? You know, in, in one go you can make it available all over India. It helps your PR campaign. Second, inventory. Okay, so um, with Jackfoot365.com, when people buy online, my entire stock is sitting in one place. It's all sitting in in, in, in Kochi. And as the order comes in, we send it through DTDC by, uh, by Surface Courier. So as the order comes in, the material leaves here. So my stock is only in one place. So I, I have better control over my inventory when I have an e-commerce model. Now, second part um, is about you know, um, cash. So as a startup, you have to win. Uh, cash flow is critical for you, right? So how do you, how do you ensure you, know, you have a positive cash flow model? So the traditional retail model, you have it available in the shelves. And the money comes back when, when somebody sells it. So that's how much cash outstanding you have. The more you grow, the more cash outstanding you have. Unless you have a cash and carry model. When you're, when you're an established brand, you can dictate that. Till then, you have your inventory lying out there. With, uh, uh, and, th and I'll talk about the bad of e-commerce, okay, so, uh, especially in India. So with an e-commerce model, people pay by credit card. Cash comes in first, then goods leave. So I'm always on a positive cash flow model. Money comes in first, then goods leaves my god on. So I mean, from a startup point of view, that is a, that's, that's a risk averse business. You're not chasing for ca collections. Whereas people get emotional, I'm not offering cash on delivery. They used to, they're pampered with the cash on delivery model. 
cash on delivery is model is poised to fail it is poised to fail it is it is it is it is not a good business model but to encourage people to pay online or to to get online um, they have offered the cash on delivery model it is a negative cash flow model your goods get there and then if they don't buy it you have to you, have, you also have to pay pay for the reverse logistics okay so you, you have cash outstanding and then you have to who do you rely on collecting the money it is not through post office so you have to have the machinery out there to collect the cash back right so collecting cash back is also expensive so i insisted on cash on delivery only sorry only credit card no cash on delivery which is not good if you if you thinking about valuation if you thinking about you know scaling if you thinking about you know volume business but to start up to establish your brand it's a good start and that also gives you feedback and to me the first level of um um feedback whether this product is good or not is about repeat customers somebody who bought it online they come back to my facebook page they like it and then they ask for recipes and they come back and order more when i see start seeing the repeat orders that's when i see okay my product is good till then i have no clue and to give, to, to give an example of of uh, the book so god's own office has been selling it's on the best seller for for the last 5 weeks but i still have no clue where is it selling um I mean what kind of audience are they buying it i have no because you lose control you have given it to the distribution you have given it to the, to, to the channel and you have to wait for a few months to get the channel reports whereas with with jack for 365 i know exactly which age group of women are buying my my product between 25 and 35 and predominantly from bangalore I mean those who are can you hear me okay so those who are so i can see the age group and they they're craving for recipes right so they need recipes they used to you know buying something from the shelf get a recipe prepare something within 20 minutes so they're craving for recipes so i know that okay recipe is going to be critical for my product promotion so that kind of feedback you can get on e-commerce tied with social media but when it comes to traditional channel but you know, but other side what let's talk about what's what's bad um i must tell you in the in the first few weeks god's own office sold more books than jack for 365 because it's available everywhere you read it on the newspaper you read it on indian express you read it on on you know on, on t- when you see it on tv then you walk through the airport you see the you see the book out there oh i heard about this book let me go i mean you you have you create the brand awareness through pr then if they see it they will buy it so the you will get more volume if you have it available on the shelf everywhere people see it so getting on to online and to use a credit card you I mean significantly low in number but it's good for a startup it's good to prove your model now once you scale it now we we I mean i got the feedback we have got 50 recipes now we we are test launching in in kerala f- through retail um, starting you know january we will have it in in, in kerala we are giving it in, in in dubai so we have the um, so all those feedback which we got through the e-commerce as well as through the social media we have incorporated that into the model and now that we are scaling then second uh, on the price so i mean we talked about the benefits of reach we talked about inventory we talked about tax so when you're selling it from kerala only the kerala tax is applicable so you don't have a tax consultant because you only need to worry about one tax when you're selling even the e-commerce the sale happens in kerala so you only need to worry about the kerala sales tax whereas if you make it available in retail shops you have to worry about every state tax when from a scalability point of view you know those are things which you have to factor in right so you need to have the tax consultants looking at the t- local tax laws at every every state now um what's the other one which i talked about okay so um in so we reach inventory uh, tax uh, cash flow media uh, low volume and then uh, there's one more thing okay price yeah we talked about price right so um so jack for 365 price is 299 per pack i can only do it if it is online because you can charge the delivery extra so when you give it in retail retail mrp includes the delivery charge to the local shop so i mean if you think about the cost of transportation to chennai and then all the distribution channel then retail is margin all that has to be included into the mrp then you have to put uh, that's the mrp price whereas when you give it an e-commerce model you can give an mrp plus delivery charges so from a from a product perception point of view your price can be without the delivery charges you, you understand what i'm so talking about 
Whereas with the, with the traditional channel, you don't have an option. Because you have to recover all the cost up to the shop. So from a perception point of view, I mean, people understand delivery charges is actual. And it's not the product cost. It is the product price plus delivery charges. So, so you can keep your price low, even though the actual total cost of ownership is same. But from a, from a branding point of view, you are telling them what is your actual price. And then, you know, retailer's margin, you can play around with it when you are um, uh, using the e-commerce model. You can work on a lower margin compared to the traditional channel. So benefits, I talked about, you know, um, reach, inventory, tax, cash flow, media, negative, lower volume. Okay, with that I conclude and we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Next we have the Q&A session. Over to our moderator, Mr. Deepak Aswani. We just have about uh, five or six minutes. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi. Please uh, introduce yourself. Hey, and, I'm uh, Azif. Uh, I am Who a are you addressing the question to? Uh, to GSF. Uh, to the jack jackfruit guy. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, you said you are probably, uh, you know, envisaging moving a model into brick and mortar size. So, wherein moving away from the online or so okay. soon you are actually by January you are hitting the retail, right? Yes. Brick and mortar basically. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just asking you, but uh, if you see Xiaomi's or the one plus ones, they are still working on the online mode. If it's purely from a mm -hmm. product visibility per se, just asking you. So even uh, these guys also still work on an online mode. They don't have an brick and mortar selling model, business model at all. Correct. Okay. So you're so asking me why am I? Yeah, exactly. So why? why okay. Why am I trying the uh, retail model? Other way around, you know, going back. So in, in terms of, you know, uh, what we wanted to achieve from a branding point of view, in terms of uh, the media coverage, in terms of getting the Jackfruit 365 and the health awareness, con I mean, I think, I think almost everybody has heard about Jackfruit 365 now, in terms of from a product awareness point of view, as well as the health benefits of it, and to rebrand it as, a, as an aspirational food. You can make many, many um, healthy dishes with Jackfruit. That we have achieved, especially in Kerala and in South of India, we have achieved that, and the metros, we have achieved that. Now to increase sales and look, you know, I am here to create an organized market for jackfruit. And my end goal is to have fresh jackfruit, ready to cook jackfruit available in, in hygienically packed packs available in local shops. And that is the end goal. So um, um, more than an entrepreneur, it is the campaign. It is, it is, it is the, uh, the, the, the mission is to have, I mean, uh, the example which I give is, you know, I mean, if you give a live chicken to a housewife today in a city, how many of them will make it? None, right? That's how uh, if you give a whole jackfruit to housewife. That's how come it takes, it takes one and a half hours and four hands. So you have to, be, now mushroom is available in the market, ready to cook in, in pack, in the chiller tray, in the, in, the, in the shop. And that is where we need to get to. To get that, I need to make it available in the shops. So the local farmers know that okay, if somebody is going to pay 299 rupees for a freeze dried jackfruit, if I give fresh jackfruit ready to cook, people are willing to buy it. They, they, they will buy it and that is the, the confidence we need to give it to farmers. Farmers currently feel that, okay, jackfruit falls from the tree. Nobody will pay a price to buy jackfruit. That is why you don't see the ready to cook jackfruits in the market. So to get that, I need to make it available in local shops in local cities. But for the Indian professionals, I can still manage the, um, uh, the online model. Thank you. There's a question for Naveen. So this is from uh, Nainan. Uh, so he wants to know the most reliable uh, payment gateway. Okay. Um, I mean, there's many. Uh, a famous one is authorized.net. That's a global payment gateway. Uh, but you may also want to outsource it to Google or Amazon. Okay. Uh, but uh, you can even discuss with the, uh, you can call the bank up uh, if you're dealing with SBI or ICCI. Uh, they'll have sort of a uh, merchant banking division and they'll give you some advice. Okay? But authorized.net is a well-known one. Uh, but honestly, you can shop around for this. I think you can do a little bit of research and you can find a good deal. 
Yeah, one second. There's a question for me. Uh, being a Raymond's, uh, being an established brand for textile and its quality, what has stopped you from being a franchisee of some international brands as you have the opportunity of manufacturing in India under license? This uh, could have added more customers for international brands and retain the market share. Uh, incidentally, what's happened is, it's the other way around. Raymond's has just come out with a strategy to procure wool from Australia and now manufacture it in Italy. Italy is supposed to be the fashion capital of the world. And uh, the brand is called Regalio Italio. And that is shortly coming into India and it goes with the Prime Minister's objective of make in India ultimately. Because if we start making foreign brands here, I don't think we are satisfying that Indian aspect. As it is, Raymond's has got tremendous equity. We have a 90% brand recall. The sub-question uh, saying what is the roadmap of pushing some ready-mades in other uh, formats like franchisee, shop and shop, we, they are, we're already doing it. It's available in multi uh, uh, outlets. Like in Shopper's Stop, you have a shop and shop. We have franchise outlets. We have uh, MBOs stocking the brands and so on. Ultimately, it's a numbers game. Any other question? Minus for Joseph. Um, uh, you were, uh, first of all, brilliant concept. Can we see you, ma'am, if oh, you don't sorry, mind? Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, you were talking about how, uh, for your online model, you deal only with... Yes, hold it closer to you. Hold it closer. Hold it slanting this way. Is that good? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So you said that you only do the credit card model. You don't uh, do cash and delivery. So I just wanted to know, is that like, do you, have you, uh, you know, researched the market and you sort of feel that cash and delivery is on its way out? Or is it that you feel that for your particular product, cash and delivery won't do? Because I'm battling the same problem and I'm a little skeptical about cash and delivery. I don't know that how it's going to work and what's the kind of guarantee that I'm going to have to give to my courier fellow and what's going to happen at the other end of the spectrum. What's that lady who opens the door? What's she going to say? And, the, and uh, some research that I read somewhere says that how this cash and delivery works and why it works so well is because, see, there's, a, there's, there's an X amount of householder's income. So when she's done with all her dal and chawal and tail and all that and you know whatever is left over is her is, is her shopping and so it varies from month to month and that's how she prefers to use it so ignoring that is also not um, uh, possibly sensible but that again you know it's a dilemma Correct. so it's i mean why why i chose not to i mean um, i mean as a, as a student of business um, my view is that cash and delivery uh, is poised to fail and I, i'll i'll Poised to fail. I mean, because it it's, it's beats my business acumen. It's I mean, if it's for a valuation game, if you I mean, I'll. So part of my role before I started this, I was a mentor to many startups, and one of them, um, I when I analyzed their business model, I found out that they were spending more money to collect the cash than the actual cash they were getting. Okay, because they had the cash and delivery model, and then uh, they have to collect the cash from. So, for example, you got two options. You uh, they, they are a broker um, in the in the model which um, um, Professor uh, showed earlier. They are a broker. You got two options. You pay by credit card, or you give it to the uh, manufacturer directly when they del when they supply. Okay, so the manufacturer collects the money after the, after they give it, and then th they have to send somebody to collect the money from the manufacturer. And their valuation, so for them to get the VC funding, they need to have a lot of transactions. So to increase the transactions, they provided the cash and delivery model. And the, for the manufacturer, they go and give it and they collect the money. They get free business. I mean, they, they get free leads. They get that. But then the, this guys will send somebody to collect the, uh, because the percentage is very, lim for a broker, the percentage is very low. You go there to collect the money and then they say, okay, look, uh, why don't you come tomorrow? You don't get the money that day. And they go back next day to collect the money. Three or four times they make the trip, it's, it's costing them more than the money they're collecting. So cash on delivery model, you have to think, you have to work the c cost of collection and the risk exposure you have. Because, I mean, as your business grows up, I mean, mo moves up, that's the amount of cash you have outstanding. You have inventory, so one bad news, all of that material will come back. Th think of the risk exposure which you have. Okay, if they haven't paid the money and you start, you start expanding, you start growing, you have more um, products out there and then one fine day, one bad news, you, that is how much risk you have.
So you th think about your tolerance and then you can do it. Uh, this cash and delivery uh, model, you take it for other products also, like garments for example. This morning we talked about the trust factor, you know, whether you have trust in the consumer or you have trust in the uh, supplier. That's a major factor. There are people who buy garments, wear it for that particular day and come and return it the next day. It happens in India only. So, <laughs> I'd like to ask the audience a quick question before we uh, wind up. I have a question, Deepak. Yes, sir. Naveen, can I? Can I ask my question? Yeah. An important question. How many of you think that uh, online uh, retailing is going to overcome or uh, beat traditional retailing? It's hardly 40 percent. Some of the products. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, well, this is two questions to Naveen. Why did Dell have to tweak their business model in India? The second question is, what is the revenue model for intermediaries? Okay. Uh, uh, the problem with Dell is, uh, you know, in the U.S., $500 may not be a huge amount. It's a significant sum, right, but it's not a major amount. 30,000 rupees is a lot of money. Right? And spending 30,000 rupees on something you've never touched uh, isn't something that sits well with us. Although that's changing. A lot of people are now buying jewelry online. They're spending uh, up to 50,000 or lakh uh, buying gold from uh, Carrot Lane and other places. Right? Uh, but largely it's because of the touch and feel aspect. Right? Uh, in the uh, West, computers are saturated. Right? Everyone pretty much knows what they're getting. Uh, but that's not very true here. Uh, so it's still a significant purchase. Uh, it's changed in the last 10 years, but if you go 10 years back, buying a laptop is the same as buying a scooter or even your first car. It was a major significant purchase. And people just weren't willing to sort of buy or spend that kind of money without touching, feeling, and talking to someone about the product. Right? But that's changing now. You know, these days, it's not really a major issue for a uh, white collar employee uh, to spend 25, 30,000. They're okay with that. Your second question? Uh, Infomediaries is largely ad based. Ad -based. So quicker and OLX, uh, they'll make most of the money through ads, but they can also make money uh, through things such as sponsored listings. So we'll put your listing at the top of the page uh, and we'll leave it there for one week. You pay us 99 rupees for that. But it's largely ad based. I think we'll uh, wind Last up with this. Yeah, it's time. To Naveen only. How does a WhatsApp make money without uh, any ads? Yeah. What is their uh, business model? Okay. Uh, right now, they don't uh, need a business model because uh, money is coming in. Right? Uh, they have the eyeballs. Yeah. But eventually, it'll probably be, again, ad-based. Uh, they do charge uh, money. Uh, they charge, I think, uh, $1, depending on the platform. Uh, oh, but uh, I have been using for the last three years, but every six months, they keep up giving another six months. So yeah. uh, right now, they're at the uh, growth stage. Right? They just want you. They, uh, they know they'll make money out of you three years from now. The goal is to grab you, which is what Facebook did. Right? Okay. Uh, and now they're making money. Uh, Again, we're running out of time, but it'll be ad-based. But WhatsApp has a lot of possibility for gift giving and uh, retailing as well. Okay. Also, does uh, Facebook also s uh, make money out of selling data? I means data of uh, uh, users. No, no, no. Okay. because that'll be the end of the company if they do that. Okay. No, but at least some uh, demographic data is well, like what uh, age group? I, I think we will stop for now. We can have a discussion sure. in the hallway. Sure. Sure. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Navin, for the uh, wonderful presentation, and. Uh, Thanks a lot, uh, James, for the jackfruit. We are still waiting to eat jackfruit as f at the earliest. So I'm sure the next time in Taikon, jackfruit would be buy served. Buy it online, credit card. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Thank you so much. The sessions were very informative. I'm sure each one of you sitting here are brimming with these valuable information. So let's give a huge round of applause to these wonderful dignitaries over here. As a token of love, respect and honor, we have a small memento. And to give away the mementos, may I invite S. Gopakumar, the charter member of Thai. Yes, a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you so much.